Hey, Katie. Hi there. Yes. How are you? Oh, good. Thanks a lot. Um, guys, welcome to another episode of RevOps and ABM Alignment. Today we have uh, Katie from Walnut. Katie, we were just talking before about Southeast Asia and uh, how you, you, you wanted to have a six months uh, gap year and it ended up with six years, right? Or can, five. can you tell it's us close. more about this? Five, okay. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, I, it's it's something I share. People are always looking for an interesting fact or something you can't you know read on LinkedIn or figure out just on paper. And uh, I think one of the more interesting things about me is that I, uh, yeah, a, a six month gap year turned into about five years of uh, working for a nonprofit and volunteering for a nonprofit uh, before I went to university. So I grew up in super small town, Tennessee, had never left the country, uh, traveled very, very little. I think I'd been on an airplane <clears throat> maybe once, uh, no, twice in my life before I graduated high school. Um, so I wanted to have a little adventure before I started college and ended up having a much longer adventure than my parents would have hoped um, or expected, um, but definitely became uh, some of the most pivotal foundational years of my life with mo most of my career has been some way uh, built on top of them. So very grateful for that, that time and that experience for sure. So, yeah, and then you went directly into SaaS. I see that you worked at Meltwaters News, then Salesforce then Insight Pool, then you have Marketo under your belt, you have a demand base, which is big in ABM space, uh, Pendo.io, member of Pavilion, our lovely community, or in the past Revenue Collective, and now Walnut. So, huge experience, and I think the listeners will get a lot of insights when it comes to the evolution of, of RevOps and evolution of ABM. And just before we start, I was asking you, what's top of mind for you today? So we can peel the onion on, on that topic that is top of mind for you. Sure. Well, there's, uh, as I was uh, giving some commentary around, I'm a, I'm a first time CRO. So I've been at Walnut for just over three months now. Uh, it's my first CRO role. Uh, we're very much in startup mode. So Walnut's been around for about four years, uh, was founded right before COVID. So very much also founded in a very interesting time uh, just in the universe in general. Uh, so lots and lots of things that are top of mind in the role that I'm in currently. I own, own all of our revenue functions. So um, sales, customer success, uh, support, uh, marketing does not report into me directly, uh, but obviously very, very close partners with all that we are doing uh, when you think about go to market holistically. So I was telling you one of the things there's many things again that are top of mind and uh, lots of things that we're solving for and building but one of the i think maybe unique things about walnut is that it has been built primarily on an inbound motion like our marketing team is just phenomenal in so many different ways and did a really good job of building uh, brands and being incredibly creative and interesting uh, if you check out our brand it feels a little bit more like I a, a b2c brand amazing. so they've done I an incredible job yeah, of, of building some super solid top of funnel, which is incredible as a sales leader walking in, you're like, oh, this is amazing. We have you know more leads showing up than we necessarily know what to do with. Um, but most of us also know that to build a healthy, long-term, predictable, scalable, you know, high growth revenue org, um, you've got to figure out how to do both inbound and outbound well, uh, or at least in our world, we absolutely have to build a foundation of all things account-based, who are the, what's the absolute epicenter of our ideal customer profile, what are the right personas uh, that we know we can make wildly successful that need to be driving the conversation. So um, while of course not disrupting the magic that is inbound and some of the things that the team is continuing to do really well there, um, we are very much knee deep in uh, creating that kind of that foundational layer of what will become our outbound and our account-based uh, strategy as well. Yeah, so guys, if you want to see some how how to do a good copy of a uh, SaaS? Just go on Walnut.io. Like even the headline, you know, like you just go in and you know what it's all about. Like buyers. Well, I, will take, go I take nuts. zero credit for any of that. Nevertheless, buyers will go nuts over your demos. Yeah, like that tells you everything, right? <laughs> So it tells you like, really, and if you go on the, I, I love the LinkedIn uh, banner that you have, like you have these, this, um, what's your favorite one? Is, There's a few. Yeah. It, it's this old guy that is on every stock image <laughs> and, uh, 
before Walnut is this boring old guy, but then after Walnut, he has these fancy glasses and he's like much, uh, much more fun. So uh, well, we think SaaS products for the most part are really, really incredible, but uh, SaaS sellers and SaaS go to market organizations don't typically do the best job of showcasing their product in all the magical ways that they can. So that's what the, the platform is designed or, or built to do. Yeah, I love it. It's it's like uh, Gong at the beginnings. They also had all this fun type of uh, um, ads and copy and so on. Well, going Gong back is an to... incredible brand, so we'll take that compliment all day long. <laughs> so let's go back a bit to, to your experience because um, – I need to ask you, like, you were director of sales and you, you were in sales and in marketing so many years and now CRO, like, what's the difference? What's the difference between what you did in the past and now as a CRO? Oh, well, there's a lot of differences. Uh, probably like most salespeople and sales leaders, I accidentally stumbled into a career in sales. You called out my first job at Meltwater uh, right out of college. That was very much accidental. I think they tricked me into the interview by having the word international <laughs> management in the title. Had no idea it was a BDR or BDR slash AE role. Um, <laughs> best mistake of my life though. Loved it. Incredible company. Learned so much, not just about sales, but about business in general. Um, but certainly realized that I love B2B sales and I love all things tech and, and SaaS in general. Um, but you're right. Up until my most recent role, a majority of my career has been leading sales teams directly. Um, and I've had various responsibilities for post-sale and customer success and expansion revenue, um, but it has been very much anchored around how do we sell our products or how do we sell more of our products to our customers. Um, and now in the role that I'm in today, uh, I've got to look at the entirety of the revenue engine. So everything from where's the demand coming from, how much we have to spend for that demand, how does it convert through the funnel, how do we make our customers stickier, how do we grow the lifetime value of those customers uh, overarchingly, and then how do we connect that in to the whole business? So how do we create the right feedback loops to make sure that product is fully engaged with our customer base and our internal go-to-market organization? And how do we make sure that whole cross-functional flywheel really connects? Um, because mm -hmm. the revenue really is at the heartbeat of, of any uh, you know tech company or any SaaS company and figuring out how to connect all of those dots uh, in the right way, I think is probably the, the biggest thing that is maybe a more for an evolution compared to the roles that I've done in the past. Really fun, but lots of new challenges as well. So uh, in, in today's topic, we will talk about ABM and, and actually inbound and outbound. And this is something interesting on how we combine combine the two you said that walnut is from like mainly inbound right so how would you like you have the demand based experience also the the abm platform um i'm just curious like how would you tackle you know the alignment between what inbound does and what we do in the demand generation and how different ABM campaigns are to to those dimension and to those demand uh, campaigns. So because there is sometimes a confusion and and maybe sometimes a thin line between okay what is demand generation right because you can have that focus demand generation on industries let's say um but it's not really ABM right like it's still a focus dimension and uh, then you have ABM that can be one to one on one to few, right? But it's always this. We we need to find this distinguish uh, to distinguish the two. So how how do you see that alignment sure. and then distinguishing first? I think and probably all of us can agree that go to market holistically is changing probably faster than we've ever experienced in our career. So yeah. I mean. How I would answer this question today is probably very different than how I would have answered it maybe three years ago or five years ago. Um, but one of the things that fundamentally feels the most different is that we we've, we've had we've been forced to make a shift outside of just this lens of what's inbound versus what's outbound, what's coming to us versus what are we going to create. Like I think we have to continue the evolution to when we think about demand, like it's got to be all bound. Like we're not even just talking marketing and sales; we're talking about our partner ecosystem, our customers, like what's that flywheel look like in terms of all the different ways that we generate revenue, generate demand, create demand. Um, and I think gone are the days of thinking like, or fighting over the credit of marketing source this or sales source this. Um, so they definitely are 
very different in terms of the motion, in terms of how you're satisfying that demand. Um, but I think to answer your, or at least how I understood the foundational piece of your question of how do we think about demand gen and account-based marketing or the one to few or one to many differently? Like for me, the ICP and understanding like the core of who our absolute best customers are and who our absolute best customers should be has to be the foundation. So like when I talk about at Walnut, we're building that foundational layer of our outbound motion. It's not that our entire revenue engine is going to be driven by outbound, but we have to have the right foundation in place to know, okay, this is our ICP 100%. These are the types of companies that are most successful. This is the size of company, the size of a revenue organization, the types of products that they're selling. Like it doesn't mean that a ton of other people can't be customers, but like this is the core of what that ideal customer profile looks like. And within that, here are the personas that we know are going to be most successful. And then from there, Ideally, you're using amazing account-based marketing tech and all the different layers of data, but you're building really specific target account list on top of that information or that data layer to understand who do we want to orient the whole company around, not just a, a list that you're going to load up into, you know, an email can span and, and say like, you know, go send a bunch of emails to these 2000 companies because we want to sell to them. Mm. But it's what are the companies that we want to orient the entire business around? And ABM or the entire the, the marketing organization holistically is a huge part of that. How do we orient marketing around this subset of the whole universe that could be our customers? These 500 accounts or these 1,000 accounts, how do we orient the way that our website looks, the experience that they have when they interact with our website, the content that we build anchored around our customers? How do we tell the right stories that align with that ICP? All the different layers. Marketing is obviously just one piece, but for me, it's about orienting the whole company around that target account list and that ICP so that you are able to succeed in that all bound motion. Mm -hmm. So we build the foundation and I'm curious because you work at demand base. At, at what's the best ABM platform in the world? Best ABM platform in the best world. Best ABM platform in the world, in my opinion. <laughs> what, the question is when do we engage with demand base and, and when do we get it? into our, let's say, ecosystem, right? So yeah. we have the foundations well, done, at what stage it makes sense and when sure. it really doesn't make any sense. Yeah, well, it's worth mentioning that it's been a number of years since I've worked at Demandbase, so I'm a little bit further away from the tech. Um, when I was there, uh, you absolutely needed to be a mid-size or a large company to really mm. unlock the value of a demand base, six cents, that type of platform. Um, at Walnut, we're, we're too small. We, we don't need the the intense ABM layer from a tech perspective um, that they would bring to the table um, because we are so early in that journey of building that st more strategic outbound motion. Generally, like the, the line or the threshold I would think about is somewhere between that 25 to 50 million of ARR from a company perspective, like then you're ready to go all in and start investing in account-based marketing tech. But again, that could have changed and certainly changes depending on what you're trying to accomplish in the specific go-to-market. If you're selling, if your, your entire go-to-market motion is based around selling really big deals into 200 companies, like you better be all in on ABM from day one, like the very beginning. Um, if you're a much more high velocity, more transactional motion, um, then it's probably later in your journey that you transition into that more sophisticated account-based uh, tech. Yeah, I, I would like to peel the onion here a bit. Like, um, it, It's more about the ACV. It's more about the um, how many deals you make or how many reps you have, how would you, uh, if I am a new CRO and I'm looking at these platforms, whatever that platform is, um, how should I evaluate it? Like just, just, just for our audience to really understand, okay, if you pass these checkpoints, then mm -hmm. it makes sense to look into the tech. I mean, a couple of things I would be thinking about probably is one, how large in terms of total number of companies is the realistic TAM, the total addressable market that you mm -hmm. should be selling into. If it's a huge number of company companies, then you've got to do some things at a much higher scale and you're most likely mm -hmm. going to do more small, more transactional deals out of the gate. Mm -hmm. um, that immediately would make you probably less natural of a fit for account-based marketing or account-based tech. If the either the initial TAM that you're trying to tackle or the number of companies that you're trying to land out of the gate is much smaller. That's where you have to be much more tailored and targeted to those specific individual companies. Um, and marketing is just one piece of that. But if you're going to be very, very specific in terms of who you're trying to sell to, um, you asked a question about is it is it ACV or the size of the deals? To me, mm -hmm. I would probably be thinking through the lifetime value of the customer or at least the first mm -hmm. 
couple of years of ARR of the customer because it could absolutely be a land and expand motion where you may only going to be extracting yeah. a small deal out of the gate. True. But if it's a small deal with a really large company and you've got a very clear playbook about what expansion looks like, um, then you would probably still be a very natural fit for a more account-based strategy. Mm -hmm. That's great. So you've been in so many great companies and now with today's economy and with today's uh, you know emerging AI and the GTM changing so much. What do you think are some of the skills or competencies we as marketeers uh, we need to um, adopt? And what are those maybe behaviors that we need to let go in from our legacy? <laughs> It's interesting. I would think it's it's probably so similar when we think about marketers and sellers or revenue leaders. Like number one, we have to be fast learners. Like we have got to be able to learn and ingest information and pivot quickly, which probably also means we have to be willing to let go of the playbook that worked really well for us five years ago or the way that we did demand gen, you know, eight years ago. Like I had an amazing run at Marketo in, you know, the the not early, early Marketo days, but mid-stage Marketo days. And man, B2B marketing and sales has changed a lot since those days. So like the stuff that worked leading that mid-market team at Marketo is, looks very different than the mid-market team that I'm building at Walnut. So I have to be able to let go of that and be incredibly curious and perceptive. Like the best sellers to me are always the ones that are naturally really, really curious. They, they ask great questions, not because they memorize the right questions, but because they're genuinely really curious people and they want to dissect and understand and understand how a business works. And I think it's the exact same thing that makes a great marketer. Like you're really curious, like not just to understand the data and dissect the data, but like you also want to know like, what is it about that specific piece of copy that made it so incredible or made, drove this incredibly emotional response over this one? And you know, what was it about this experience that this type of company had with my website and how do we replicate that? And I think because there's so, and tech is just one of the factors, but man, I mean, AI is changing everything and it's changing it very quickly. So our jobs are going to look different in two years than they do today. And so I think if we're curious and willing to invest the time to learn and ideally able to absorb information and learn relatively quickly, that's that's going to be more than ever what separates great you know, marketing leaders and revenue leaders you know, from the rest, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I must build on that. Like talking of talking about curiosity. Uh, so what are those playbooks that would not work today? Just for like, clearly put it out there in maybe even in bullet points like this 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 out <laughs> oh it's a great question i don't know i don't know if i have an exact or a specific enough answer that would satisfy you or your audience uh probably the most obvious difference is outbound so how a seller thinks about doing mm. outbound cold calling and emailing like that has you got to throw the old scripts out the window for sure even just in terms of the number of emails you had to send how much personalization was required the, what the cadences looked like. I mean, some of the stuff that we used to do where you would, you know, load up everything into sales loft or outreach. It was like a nine touch email sequence. And some of them would be like, just bumping this to the top of your inbox. Like, and you had data around <laughs> when you would get responses on the third touch versus the fourth touch. Like we're in it because of AI and tech, like we're inundated with so much more content and information like I don't open cold emails anymore. I have, I get so many spam calls and robo calls that I can't answer my phone. Like I can't answer a number that I don't know. So thinking, you know, strictly from the perspective of a seller, like back in my Marketo days, we had a lot of inbound as well, but we knew that, you know, all three years that I was there, roughly 25% of our pipeline had to come from sales generation. So AEs were sourcing, sending emails, sending cold calls um, or networking within their territory. And the way they did it, then absolutely would not scale or work today. I mean, a hundred percent. Okay. So I will, I, I, now you were talking about call script and I just pulled out here from our drive, uh, a call script that I had from the past. And I, I just want to read it to you or like, like simulate. And you tell me if this is something working or we need to rewrite it. Right. So SDR, um, hey, Katie, this is hey Romeo here. <laughs> do, you want, do you want me to role play is, it with you? Or yeah, you let's read? role play it. Let's okay. role play it. Let's role play it. Um, here it's with the 
placeholders, but I will I will uh, wing it. So, hey, Katie, Romeo here. Hi, Romeo. <laughs> nice to meet you. Actually, you and I haven't spoken before. I know I'm probably catching you in the middle of something, but I was hoping you could help me out for a moment. Uh, sure, what do you need? So that first line, that first line, is that something we need to rewrite? Is it is like is this an old, I think, 2018 script that I got out from, from my drive? Um, is that something that, that onshore, then not that pitchy type of a thing? I'm being fully honest with you, uh, type of a tone. Is that something we need to rewrite or would, would this still work? I mean, I think the challenge in terms of whether or not it will work or not is whether you can get someone to pick up the phone uh, because that's happening that's less and less. Assuming that you can get, like, I can almost guarantee in my scenario, if I picked up the phone, it's probably because I was expecting a call from my three-year-old's preschool or my doctor mm. or some, for some reason something was going on. So I probably thought you were someone else. And I'm going to be like relatively polite. But in that scenario, like, if you introduce it that way, hey, you probably weren't expecting my call, may have caught you in the middle of something. Can I grab 30 seconds? Like, I'm in all likelihood, I'm not going to be rude. So I will at least hear you out or let you ask uh-huh. a question for you and most likely. Got it. Got it. So the, so I love that you just the, pulled that out of your Google Drive from 2018 though. <laughs> yeah, I think I think this is the biggest challenge, right? Like the data, like Zoom info and Cognizant and all of those. They might have good data for emails or for names, but the connection rate is bad, right? I think this yeah. is this is something that um and I don't know why it's happening. Like maybe 2018 the data was better and now they just don't update it. I have no idea what happened along the way. But I think that's a, that's a big challenge. And what well, I remember saw too, in 2018, so many of us were working in an office as well. And yeah, that's true. Today, very few of us are. Um, so that made, I mean, even some, like think about some of the technology that's layered into, you know, ABM, being able to de-anonymize websites, things like that. Like now that we all work from home, or many, many of us work from home, like there's a lot of those pieces that become a little bit more challenging as well. Hmm. And another thing that I see, and I think it will change, is this whole social selling thing. Like two years ago, it was not, uh, maybe, yeah, 2018, how many years is that? Like, uh, six. More than two. <laughs> more than two yeah so social selling was not there so if you were really good in content and you're writing really good posts you will you will um you know you pop out uh, in linkedin but nowadays i see that this is also a bit uh, uh too much because because of ai everybody is suddenly yeah. a linkedin guru and a linkedin posting on linkedin so that's something that I believe we need to be aware of and, and, and change. Um, so h- how do you see all this um, evolving with the future? Like calls not working that well anymore. Outbound with the emails is harder and harder. Gmail is changing the, I mean, Google and Outlook yeah. and all of them are changing the algorithms of emails. You cannot send that many emails anymore. They can detect spam much faster. Um, so you have these challenges of email deliverability. Then you cannot get connected with, you know, clients. Then social selling, it's, and all the LinkedIn is getting too crowded. It's, it's a mess out there because of AI. Because you just have a lot of AI-generated LinkedIn posts. Even LinkedIn suggests you to right with their premium ai right so how how can we live in all this uh, crowded messy world from my perspective I think it, it just points us back to even my earlier statement around this like reimagining this concept of all bound like sales and marketing or go to market and marketing have to work together in new ways and creative ways because the reality is most of the time we're not going to get in front of someone that doesn't have at least a remote interest in what we're selling 
Like that's the reality of sellers. Like Mm -hmm. no matter how good your script is or how great your emails are, if you're not meeting some at least barely felt need that that person has, they don't have the capacity to prioritize that conversation or that evaluation. No matter how good your personalization is or how amazing that direct mailbox you put together is, like they've got to have some element of interest in what you're doing, which requires, you know, a marketing and a revenue team that is building really great educational content that's talking about why the need that you're meeting is so important. Like, hey, go to market. I mean, this is what we talk about at Walnut. Go to market's changing so incredibly fast. So the way that you get people in front of your product has to change. The way that your sellers are interacting with your product and with their buyers has to change. It has to be different. And so you get people in conversations because you're like, oh, you're right. Like it is changing. Things are really hard. We'll at least have a conversation. Then we've got to be really good at selling the thing and making sure that we can actually deliver on what it is that we are, you know, the problem that we're trying to solve. But if people aren't at least initially interested in finding new ways to solve that problem, I don't think it matters how good our pitch is or how great that marketing copy is. Like at the end of the day, we've we've got to be solving a problem that matters to that buyer, um, which gets back to mm-hmm. that ICP and the persona discussion. Like we've got to be clear. Like, even if they don't know it yet, like who are the companies that could most benefit from what it is that we're selling? And then who are the individuals within those companies that if we can figure out how to make them aware, like we will make a massive impact on making them successful. And if you can figure out those things, there's lots of creative ways you can do to, you know, a lot of creative things you can do to get the conversation. But I do think you've got to be clear on the problem that you're solving and it's got to matter enough. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm. I, I just want to get back to Walnut before we before we end. So you guys are Series B, all public, thirty five mil. Um, it's Series A, right? No, Series no, B. Series sorry, B. Yep. Series B. Series B. Just said it. <laughs> and um, I'm just wondering, like, what does a um, CRO do in in series B and how uh, how is this different than let's say series A like what what are you trying to achieve to get to that series C um compared to series A like what how how does the dynamic change well this is my first time being a CRO um so it's the mm-hmm. only company I've ever been a CRO at so I don't know if I can answer the specific question in terms of what was different from a you know earlier stage or a series A or precede company versus a series B um I can tell you at the stage that we're at I mean which we're you know roughly 75 employees still very small I mean the the two things that I am constantly obsessing over is how do we land more of the right customers and ensure that we're giving them a great experience through the sales process so that they're set up to be wildly successful as customers and then how do we keep and grow more of those customers? Like the, everything fits into those two buckets of how are we going to excel what we're doing on the sales side of the house? And then how do we get really, really good at that post-sale experience so that our customers are so successful with our product that eventually over time, we're going to build more things. We're going to release more things. We're going to do more things. And of course, we would like to be able to sell them more things over time and extract more value from those customers. Um, so it's just both sides of those equations. And then it's all of the various cross-functional teams that I work with and my team works with to ensure we can deliver on those. So I spend a lot of time aligning on that overarching marketing plan. Like what are all the things that we're doing throughout the funnel um, where marketing touches to support um, and then products, the other big piece there. So like what are all of the ways that we're orienting our product team and product organization mm-hmm. around our customers? Um, and it helps that at Walnut, we are power users of our own product. So we are literally customer zero. Mm-hmm. We're using the product all day, every day. We use it sales. We use it for CSMs. We use it for how we cover, you know, uh, support, like all the different aspects of the business. Um, so then that gives us a lot of opportunity to provide feedback and say like, hey, if we could just do this one other thing with Walnut, it'd be so powerful. Or here's a really great story of how I used the product and it did this other thing that we hadn't really thought of. Um, so orienting the whole business around how my team uses the product and ensuring that they get visibility um, is probably another thing that's a really important part of my job that is a bit unique just because we are the, the organization that we sell into. And so we're customer zero in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. So it's like, when I when I scroll here, like I I didn't use the the tool, but I suppose it's like from what uh, I I'm seeing, um, it's kind of a middle experience of doing the demos, or how do how would you uh, describe it best? Yeah, it's a great question. So it's an interactive <laughs> demo. 
platform, but you're right. There's so many different applications. Uh, and a lot of times when people think like, oh, interactive demos or getting people exposed to demos, they think of like a video or something that you're going to throw on your website. That's like this mm. moving version of your product. There's a lot of data that backs up the fact that when we say interactive demo, that means that someone on the other end of the screen is clicking buttons. So you're clicking here, then you're going to the next build and you're seeing something happen. Uh, like that's the aspect that makes it interactive. So getting those at every part of the sales and the customer journey is really impactful. So whether you're talking about getting interactive product tours on your homepage or at different places throughout the website. So people are interacting with your product long before they talk to a salesperson. Um, we have our BDRs and AEs will send, we call them walnuts, but they're sending walnuts. So interactive demos before mm -hmm. a first call happens. So it's a very lightweight, quick click path, but it's exposing someone to our product. They have versions of that that happen after a first sales conversation happens as well. So there's lots of different ways that you use interactive demos as part of your follow-up. Then through every stage of the customer journey, how you're thinking about getting multi-threaded, how you're thinking about selling to an economic buyer that might not be directly evaluating the product. It's all the different ways that you're trying to showcase and unlock what your product does that's going to be relevant for that specific buyer. Sometimes it happens on a live call like you and I are on right now. A lot of times it's mm -hmm. happening via email or other ways asynchronously. Um, um, but it's getting your buyer exposed to your product in all the different ways that they want to be exposed. Um, because in reality, our buyers want to be talking generally to sellers less. And when they're talking to sellers or CSMs or just different humans, they want it to be incredibly relevant in solving the problem that they're trying to solve. Um, so that's that's how the tech is designed uh, to function or what we're trying to solve for. Yeah, and the audience here is a lot into RevOps. And I see here uh, this product Deal Intel, yeah. Like it integrates with Salesforce. Uh, can you tell us more about this and why someone would need this in their life, or how it makes their life easier with Deal Intel? Yeah, it's it's a super cool cool view. It's basically just a tab that's embedded into your opportunity object in Salesforce. Um, in the way mm -hmm. that you might look at emails or conversations that are happening through Gong, it gives you visibility into all the product demos that are happening and who's interacting with those product demos in different ways. Uh, and then of course there's insights and scoring that happens like, oh, the Walnut engagement score here is really high because there's so many different types of buyers that are interacting with different product demos throughout the workflow. Um, you also can launch all of this from directly within Salesforce. So literally you click a button, you've got a seller that's able to deploy a personalized interactive demo directly from within Salesforce. Uh, a ton of other cool stuff that we do directly inside of Salesforce. The, the whole vision is to empower sellers in particular and CSMs to work the way that they work. So everything is driven directly from Salesforce as opposed to having to go to a, you know, a different system and you know, log in and do things in different places. So let me understand. It's like mm, if I am on let's say a landing page creator it would a landing page creator like on bounce could they be your customer or who, yeah. who would be the yeah. Yeah, well, so. think, yeah, absolutely. Anytime that you want to personalize something. So if there's, maybe it's the title mm -hmm. of that landing page, maybe it's the visual, maybe you want a looping mm -hmm. video that goes in that, like when you're as a salesperson demoing that product, whatever the variables are that you might change within a demo environment or within your live environment, thinking if you're I don't know, showing something that you embed into Salesforce, oh, in a dream world, I would want to make sure I'm not showing personal information here and I've got the relevant industry here and I've got the right size of ARR or the right visual showing up. Like it just gives you a very, very, I mean, it's, it's so simple. Even I can do it. And I'm a salesperson mm -hmm. at heart. Like you literally click a couple of buttons and you can decide what your variable variables are and change them in and out really easily. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the, the data that you say that it's coming back to Salesforce. So I, I just wanted to clarify it. I'm an unbounced client, let's say. Yeah, un unbounced is using Walnut. I'm going into when when does do I see Walnut somehow as a client or is it in the background or how or I have the trial and I'm using the unbounced trial and then you're getting data to Salesforce on what I'm what am I doing? So some kind of product analytics or how should we uh, use it in, um, in Salesforce, just trying to understand. So first of all, there's, there's two very different experiences. So if you're a Walnut mm -hmm. admin and you're setting up okay. these experiences, you're going to do that inside the Walnut platform. So you may be a 
someone that owns and leads sales enablement, you may be on the rev ops side of the house, but if you're responsible for building and deploying the demo structure, mm -hmm. you're going to do that inside mm -hmm. of Walnut. Then you have a lot of controls mm -hmm. in terms of what do you make accessible to sellers inside of Salesforce? So what do you want them mm -hmm. to have? with the click of a button, the ability to deploy directly from within CRM. That's the answer to your first question in terms of where mm -hmm. am I living or mm -hmm. what system am I in? In terms of that example, if you are selling to Unbounce, so they, mm -hmm. maybe you as a salesperson, you give them a demo, you send them some different product tours via email. You may have shown them a couple of live demos where you've used Walnut to personalize what they see, what they do. Mm -hmm. if, if that you as the buyer, if you are trialing mm -hmm. Unbounce as part of the process of mm -hmm. deciding whether to mm -hmm. buy, you're still using Unbounce. Mm -hmm. You're not using Walnut to do that. Like yeah. there is yeah. still going to be a lot of different ways that you're going to interact with that product specifically. We're not mm -hmm. trying to re replace Unbounce in that scenario as a product. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to make it much easier for a seller or an SC uh, to be able to showcase the different things that they want to show in a product demo. But then you still are going to interact with whatever product it is that you're evaluating or trying to buy or or maybe post-sale once you bought it. Got it. So then I I get the events as a RevOps admin, let's say, from the buyer's interaction and push it into um, into Salesforce so then the sales guys can see how the buyer actually interacted with. Yeah, the, absolutely. Uh, and, and that's really our right? focus as okay. a business is how do we make the process of the, that we go through as B2B buyers, how do we make that better? Like that's a lot of the funny ads that you talk, that you see and come across, like mm -hmm. buying mm -hmm. software sucks. Buying software is amazing. Mm -hmm. Said no one ever. Like we're trying to fix that. We want to make it easier or more delightful for companies or for people to buy software. Um, so it's trying to remove some of that. Yeah, version. that's really good. Because then if, if I'm a seller, I actually know what to talk about because yeah. I saw all those interactions. I don't need to be boring and put all the basic discovery questions. or the Yeah, if you can make the conversation because... about that buyer, about what they care yeah, about exactly. and asking questions that really solve something that matters to them as opposed to just giving generic product tours and overarching demos. So such a better use of everyone's time. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, like let's, Let's uh, give it a try, guys. If you if you are into SaaS like Walnut.io, um, they will do a cool. At least you will have a cool demo for sure. <laughs> yes, please let me know if you don't. But yes, absolutely. No, I'm just kidding. People because are they it. use the tools. So yes. Yeah. So thanks a lot, uh, Katie. It was lovely um, fire discussion about all kind of topics: RevOps, ABM. Uh, Walnut, your experience, the future uh, of marketeers and sellers. Yeah, thanks and, so much uh, for having me, Romeo. What a privilege. It was an enjoyable conversation for sure. Where, do, where can people find you and what was the latest, let's say, uh, resource uh, for sellers that you really loved and you would recommend to, to our audience? Uh, so many things in terms of where you can find me. LinkedIn's obviously the easiest spot. I'm Katie with a C. Yeah. So as long as you spell my first name with a C, I, I'm pretty easy uh, to spot in general um, or walnut.io. We're hiring for sellers and uh, enablement and some other really cool roles. So uh, if you're excited or interested, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, in terms of resources, things that I would recommend to sellers. Uh, I mean, we already talked about Pavilion, but I'm obsessed with um, with Topline Pavilion's podcast. It's not geared as much towards individual AEs or sellers, but definitely revenue leaders. Um, highly recommend. Um, that's my most recent podcast. Uh, all the other stuff, I don't know, feels very generic or highly or over recommended. So I don't think I have anything else that's wildly interesting outside of Topline. So, so what what do you like at Topline? Some episodes or some something. A anything in terms of keywords that we should look at if we go on the YouTube channel? I just think they have a great perspective. I mean, three different CEOs, but CEOs of small to mid-sized companies uh, that have been very much in the thick of it. I mean, the last year, year and a half has been tough. Like we've been in a software recession, like all of us have gotten you know, kicked in the teeth in different ways. Uh, and I think that they have very honest discussions about the reality of running a healthy, for some of them, very profitable business, but doing that in a way that's people centered and people oriented. I think they're all great leaders, but in very different ways and have very different strengths. Um, so it makes for some healthy discussion and, and dialogue. Great. So guys, check out Pavilion's podcast top line. If you are a Pavilion member like us, for sure, you know about it, but if not, 
really great uh, resources out there and become a pavilion member like it's a no-brainer really Sam needs to be paying these little accolades you're given uh, during this call out (laughs) no like I it's not about the we we just promote really good resources at the end of the day like yeah great content you have a great community yeah thanks a lot Katie and enjoy Florida enjoy the sun thanks so much have a good one Take care. Ciao. Bye-bye.